Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is this talk. I will share um, our um, stack migration experience uh, from both infrastructure to devs and um, as well as the an organization standpoint. Um, so, I will share about the motivations behind uh, our Kubernetes stack change, the experience we gain into building our own bare metal cluster and um, how we made it so that it uh, was adopted uh, by, uh, by uh, every kind of uh, text that we have at Numberly. So I will be sharing some uh, configuration examples. I will also uh, take this chance to showcase um, our GraphQL choices that we use uh, for uh, building APIs. So it's not a talk on GraphQL itself, but rather uh, about the choices. I will share also uh, examples and code examples um, to showcase the demo app. And then I will demonstrate how they fit together. Uh, so that will be about the uh, developer workflow. Uh, so, so it is. Um, so uh, just a quickie a bit, uh, about myself. Uh, you can find me about everywhere as a uh, ultra bug. Um, I'm a Gen2 Linux developer. That's my open source life. I maintain quite, uh, quite a, a number of packages and the MongoDB one, for instance. Um, I'm a PSF contributing member because I, I open source uh, with some, uh, some, some code and work on uh, uh, some Python code. And I'm also a CTO at Numberly. Before we begin, I, uh, I wanted to share the story uh, uh, that uh, when I submitted this talk, a colleague of mine came to me and asked me this question. He came here and said, hey, Alexi, couldn't you have more buzzwords in your talk title? And so I felt obliged to answer these questions uh, since you may also have wondered it, about it uh, before you decide to come here or not. And the answer is no. So let's begin. Uh, the first thing I wanted to share is uh, our previous workflow that has been uh, up and running for more than five years at Numberly. So this is how we still are working for some part of our uh, projects, but uh, this talk is about this transition and how it's being done. So we have our friendly developers. We use uh, 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 GitLab internally. So that's where we basically have uh, code repositories, configuration repositories. We keep them separate, so there is no secrets in the code, uh, in the source code that we, uh, that we, that we have. And uh, that's where we run continuous integration, code reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically what uh, the developers are interactive and the project managers also are interacting with uh, every day. Then uh, to start the deployment uh, and the orchestration of the, of the deployment of the projects that we, we built into GitLab, we, uh, we, um, we base ourselves, the, the developers just have to create a YAML configuration file at the source, at the root of their repository. And it's basically an Ansible uh, task compatible YAML. Then we created an, uh, a web interface that we call DeployDocus um, that is basically linked to GitLab. So you log in onto it and that's uh, proxy proxying the GitLab uh, SSO. And then you can see the, the, the list of the projects that uh, you work on. And then you can start selecting it and then executing it, uh, executing an Ansible um, playbook that will run in the background uh, that will basically uh, connect to GitLab, uh, get the source code the repositories, merge them together. And so it's Ansible based. Uh, and then it will connect to all the bare metal servers that we have, uh, at least the ones that are targeted and configured in the YAML configuration file beforehand. And it will start um, create, uh, creating virtual environments, uh, so virtual arms, Python virtual arms, and take the code, deploy it inside, and then start configuring a US, and deploying a USG configuration file, uh, configuring Nginx ingress uh, configuration files, and everything at once on multiple servers um, for clusters. Um, if the project or service that we are deploying um, is a public accessible one, uh, we will need the help of uh, some uh, 
uh, network engineers uh, to set up uh, F5 load balancers, uh, which will also act as SSL offloading uh, proxies, let's say. So all the SSL will happen in the F5, usually. This is pretty cool. It's uh, working very well and it's been working very well for, for, for a long time for us, but there are still some limitations in it. Uh, well, the first obvious ones relate to the deployed Ocus web interface and to uh, the Ansible playbook that is uh, uh, running everything behind. If GitLab is changing their API for some reason, um, we have to fix it on, uh, on, uh, on, on all those orchestration um, um, uh, environments in Ansible and in deployed Ocus. So it's a bit of work. It's not happening that often, to be honest, but it happens. And when it happens, you basically end up uh, with a large herd of angry developers that can't deploy their things anyway. So it's not that cool. Um, on the server side, uh, the virtual lands that, are that we are able to create uh, on the bare metal servers depend on the Python versions available on those servers. So that means that uh, we have some uh, operation, maintenance to uh, keep up, to update, et cetera, et cetera, every, um, every uh, bare metal server that are part of the different web clusters or application clusters that, uh, that we operate. And of course, we also depend, and the developers also depend on the uh, network engineering team to do this uh, mainly manual, not fully, but mainly manual uh, SSL configuration when the, the website has to be public or the API or whatever it is that we need to be accessible on the web through an HTTPS URL. Also, you can see that it's based on uh, virtual environments, Python ones uh, mainly, so what if the developer needed a different kind of stack? That would mean that the ops uh, or DevOps people would have to uh, modify as well or deploy it on, uh, and make it available on the bare metal servers. So, and there is no uninstall feature as well. So this is something that we wanted to have for some kind of corner case problems, but it's not that important, but still there is no, hey, just forget about it and uh, uninstall it. There is no performance isolation as well, um, no st very strict one at least. So uh, you can have uh, uh, some problems sometimes when a uh, 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 developer de uh, deploys uh, a code that is uh, killing the RAM of the, no the node. So we could have just kept this and uh, rewrote a bit to the orchestration. Uh, you could ask yourself, but okay, but why don't you take all this Nginx, USD, and uh, virtual uh, 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 stack on the servers and just run them on, um, on, uh, on uh, LXC or uh, Docker or Rocket? And you would, then, you would be addressing basically what's on every node. That's right, but we, that means that we'd, we would still uh, have to, um, to keep up with all the orchestration that makes this happen. So it's solving a part of the problem. And uh, when we started that, when we felt that it was starting to be the right time to move on, actually the Kubernetes uh, uh, ecosystem was, uh, was already something that, uh, that was, let's, I won't say stable. Uh, I would say popular enough so that the community behind it uh, and, and some kind of documentation was, uh, was enough for us to go into it. So we didn't want to have to maintain this orchestration, container orchestration and things like this uh, by ourselves. We just uh, joined in the fun and decided that uh, we would be uh, building with those uh, bare metal approach our own Kubernetes cluster. So that's what we did, and uh, I'm now going to give you some, uh, some, uh, some, some, some overview of how we, we've done it. The first thing was to actually build the bear cluster, uh, so that's uh, the, the methodology. And then we had to decide on the tooling, and when I say tooling, it's, it's mainly how will the developers interact with the cluster, which is not uh, a simple question. Uh, 
actually. So you will have to take a stance on the level of abstraction that you want to give. We wrote documentation because if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. Um, and then we worked hard into making sure that this new platform, this new way, was uh, both um, adopted uh, and supported. So there are ways, organizational ways to do this, and I will share a bit later how we did it. And then we distributed the expertise so that the expertise on the Kubernetes workflow and cluster is not the thing of only the people that build it in the first place. So a lot of our production clusters uh, at Numberly uh, run on Gen2 Linux. This is part of our uh, deep dive approach on everything we, we, we do. Um, so we decided to continue on this and, um, and it's also a good chance for us to get to know and to understand all the bricks, and there are numerous in, Kuberne in the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem, how they fit together. Um, so we built it on Gen2. We leverage of, uh, on our uh, infra as code um, uh, uh, technology, no, no technology, but uh, infra as code um, um, way of approaching things. And uh, so we have already a lot of Ansible uh, playbooks that operate all those machines that I was talking about earlier. So we leverage on it and just added the full aut fully automation on deploying, reconfiguring, and provisioning machines on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, as our name says, uh, we are obsessed with uh, metrics and, uh, and numbers, so we, have, we are extensive users of uh, Grafana, and uh, whether it comes from Graphite behind or uh, Prometheus. So we built dashboards to monitor and see how the, the cluster was going on in the early stages. Then we decided to adopt a developer-driven approach when designing our cluster because we wanted to remove friction. So that was our main goal in the first place. Uh, of course, that means that it doesn't have to compromise security as well. So we will see how we, and the decision that we made to, to keep a right balance. Um, but the one thing we, we, we adopted quite early uh, was we didn't want to have too many abstractions. So actually, we decided uh, to allow developers to interact with the Kubernetes cluster directly. So they have kubectl at their disposal. So there's no helm or no uh, overlay be, uh, between the, the, the developer and the Kubernetes cluster. So that means that we also took uh, some security measures to make sure that uh, it didn't get out of hand. The first one is uh, that uh, at Numberly we are using the G Google suite, uh, so that means that every employee has a Google account, and Google, uh, the, this Google account offers an OpenID authentication, so the workflow to first authenticate on the Kubernetes cluster is to just go to a kube config URL, and then log in as usual uh, using the Google suite uh, account that they have, uh, we get the, a free MFA uh, second factor uh, um, thanks to the Google account, and every developer uh, and employee at Numberly has a YubiKey for this. Uh, then it provides them through the Gangway um, uh, project uh, their kube config that they just have to download, and they are up to start interacting directly with the Kubernetes cluster. Then we have to handle authorization and permissions, and for this we already uh, had a, a, nice, uh, a nice workflow on GitLab. So we have everyone on GitLab and groups on GitLab and roles on GitLab. So we decided that uh, it might be interesting to map all those uh, permissions and groups uh, to Kubernetes, and there was no um, project that was doing this, so we decided to open source our own and it's called GitLab to RB, uh, RBAC. So the principle is that a namespace in Kubernetes relates to a team, uh, and this team it relates to a group in GitLab. So that's how it was already working. Um, and this project just will just 
continuously map uh, the GitLab uh, namespace and groups and users and their permissions to, uh, to, to Kubernetes. So then we don't have to separate authorization and permission systems to operate. We just do everything on GitLab and it replicates to Kubernetes. So, to give you an overview of the cluster capability and choices that we make, uh, we made, sorry, um, GitLab also offers an image registry that we, of course, leverage. Uh, so that's where the images are downloaded when they are deployed on Kubernetes. Um, we enforce some QA on, on this, a security QA. Only whitelisted images can be deployed, but we don't want any random image on the web uh, running on the Kubernetes cluster. Um, we enforce uh, from the start the run as non root. That means that no container can run on Kubernetes if it's running as root. And we have strict network policies, so that's uh, netpol policies that, uh, that uh, regulates how uh, pods can discuss between themselves and or developers to pods or internet to pods. Basically, we disallow almost everything un unless it's coming from the ingress. Speaking of ingress, we are using the Kubernetes ecosystem uh, provided Nginx ingress, and we added the fully automated um, Let's encrypt uh, certificate lifecycle. So this also offers the developers to just uh, with a two, two or three lines uh, that we'll see later of, uh, of configuration to have a free HTTPS uh, endpoint. The multi-tenant cluster it means that we decided for a start, maybe it will change over time, to have all the environments uh, inside the same cluster. So we, do, we don't have a Kubernetes cluster for development, a Kubernetes cluster for staging, a Kubernetes cluster for production. It's a multi-tenant one for all environments, so that means that you can have a, pod, a production pod running uh, next to a development one. Um, there's no real consensus uh, in the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem yet uh, about this strategy. Uh, our approach was we are rolling out something, so we want to leverage on the resilience uh, and the simplic simplicity um, of, the, of the machines and the, and the workflow that we will provide. To help people get acquaintance with the cluster, we also created a special sandbox namespace that basically allows anyone that is authenticated to do anything and it's wiped every day. You don't have to read this, I just put it in for reference on the slide so that you uh, can see how we wipe it every day. So just to test. Uh, we don't have a distributed persistent storage yet. That doesn't mean that we don't provide persistent storage, but it's a simple one through NFS, so it's really mainly for now about stateless machines, uh, stateless applications. So we won't uh, be hosting uh, databases uh, on Kubernetes yet. Maybe it will come, I don't know. Um, and then when you are a, a bit obsessed about security, uh, there is a good um, uh, benchmark provided by the CIS. And uh, so we, of course, uh, made sure that uh, our cluster passed it. Then you have to write a good documentation. So I'm providing here uh, a, a, a uh, the, the topics that, are, that uh, we felt uh, and uh, was working to get it covered. So when you enter this space, all your texts may might not know what the Docker file is, so you need to kickstart them in Docker, uh, you need to kickstart them in Kubernetes, you need to kickstart them in the deployment as well, etc. So we have leveled this a bit. The idea behind this and the trap that uh, I hope we didn't fell into is not to rewrite the, docu the Docker documentation or the Kubernetes documentation. Instead, this documentation is a practical one, making references if, you, if needed, but it's a practical one. So it's uh, get your hands into it and let's go, step by step. And it's really helping, and it has helpy, been a very helpy, uh, helpful sorry, for, uh, for our developers to get their hands very quickly in the Kubernetes cluster and have concrete results. And here, the sandbox uh, namespace helps a lot because they can try and learn in it. And everything that uh, we, we ask the guys to, to test is based on, on the sandbox uh, namespace. So this is why we are building, we built this, we put a lot of effort in this actually, 
uh, because this is where lies your adoption. Speaking of adoption, we have to foster it and then you have to scale it. At Numberly, we have multiple teams uh, on multiple poles. They share the same, the same uh, core attributes, let's say uh, backend developers, but you have multiple backend developers, for instance. So in all those teams, we wanted to make sure uh, that, um, that uh, there, were, there was someone uh, that was identified and, uh, and valued as well as being able to help and give support. So that well, on not only the people that build the cluster were the main reference and were starting to get spammed, so it was not a, it's, it's not scaling that way. So we created a, uh, our internal Kubernetes certification and uh, so that the people that uh, take this uh, certification, we can make sure that they have the basic but still strong knowledge, enough at least, to make sure that they support uh, the, the, the people around them. And this is also a nice way, I think, to value the expertise of, uh, of, of members of the teams. So a quick takeaway on uh, the Kubernetes uh, side. Uh, so GitLab, we use GitLab for Airbag, uh, image registry, and with Kubernetes, it's uh, called uh, GitLab to Airbag. Uh, you can check it uh, online if it's, uh, if it's useful to you. We'd be very happy. It's written in Python. Um, we have always to balance security versus freedom. They are not opposed at all times, uh, but, uh, but uh, still that's something you have to take into account. Uh, give freedom, but not so much that uh, it can put your company at risk. Uh, that's why we have to enforce the security and QA rules from the start. It's important when for us, uh, and I guess for anyone starting in this path. Um, for now, we get reports on, uh, on not whitelisted image running. Uh, we have to do to, to make it enforceable uh, from the start as well. Um, what I like very much and what we value very much uh, in, in this approach is that now hubs can concentrate on adding features to the cluster that developers can leverage on their day-to-day -day work. And I think that this is a nice, this is, this is really nice. So instead of being cluster by cluster, now you can see and we can see our Kubernetes cluster as a set of features that we can use. Um, Having practical and docs, uh, documentation helps a lot. Um, and uh, to spread expertise, uh, maybe a certification is a, is a, good, uh, is a good trick. Um, maybe we will create more certification levels uh, later. So how does it look now? It basically looks like this. Uh, we removed the configuration repositories. Now it's moved to uh, Kubernetes secrets and to vaults, depending on, 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 on some projects. Uh, we are not finally, uh, stable entirely on this, so that's something that we're still working on. Reuser roles, they are, maps to, they are mapped to Kubernetes uh, or RBIC. Um, the groups to namespace, uh, that's where the Docker image registry is. And now, instead of having the interface uh, uh, at the bottom, we just uh, allow our developers to run kubectl uh, commands to interact with the cluster, which will in turn uh, orchestrate the pods with an ingress nginx. We have a free let's encrypt um, endpoint uh, for the, the, the projects that we need. And we still need uh, to, to work on automating the F5 SSL offloading as well for the public domains. We deploy a lot of projects every day, so you might wonder why don't you just go for Let's Encrypt and keep on this F F5 thing, right? Uh, it's because we have to face uh, some limitations from our clients, and uh, that, uh, that uh, forces us uh, to support, let's say, not so up-to-date uh, browsers. Uh, so, yeah, so we have, we have to, to, to be able to, 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 to be in between. That's especially too when you work for banks. Anyway, so now let's try to build a GraphQL application on, the, on this Kubernetes cluster, and then we'll finish with the, how it, uh, what's the workflow that, uh, that makes it happen. So the demo app that I'm, I'm taking and that I w the source code that will pro uh, is provided as well, uh, I, I thought it would be a nice uh, uh, introduction or or, or ID to, to demo how you can proxy, let's say, the Trello REST API uh, through a GraphQL endpoint. 
So you interact uh, issuing GraphQL queries that will be turned into tr uh, Trello API REST uh, queries. The first thing you're asking here is how do I do GraphQL in Python? Usually the, 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 the answer is Graphene, which is the most popular uh, and library to, to do GraphQL in Python. At the time that we were asking ourselves this question, they were not supporting uh, async IO, and we are very async IO uh, lovers, so it was kind of a problem. The other problem was the design approach of Graphene, where you basically explain your GraphQL schema as code, or as classes, etc. So this is how you, you express it. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in the GraphQL um, uh, ecosystem, as we will see later, there are other ways, and most importantly, language agnostic ways to do it. So that's why we didn't go for, for, uh, for Graphene. Instead, we went for this. So for the non-French uh, guys around here, this is called a tartiflette. It's a mountain uh, dish, let's say. It's basically potatoes, cheese, cream, potatoes with cheese, with cream, with potatoes and cheese, and a bit more cheese. You have to finish. The top must be cheese. Okay, reblochon. Anyway, and if you are very hungry, you can add the larder in it. But that's a plus. So the project itself is called Tartiflette. It's meant so basically you, you, you understand that uh, the, the, the core developers are French. They are the guys at Dailymotion. They are doing a great work. And what I like, uh, especially in uh, Tartiflate, is that uh, it's modern Python, uh, let's say. Uh, it's fully built on async IO and a good way, I, I, I think. And it, it has a, a schema first design in, in the schema definition language design. Uh, what this means is that you will express your schema using the GraphQL SDL only. So this is completely agnostic to the language. And then you will just point the Tartiflet engine to load this raw flat file, and it will load the entire schema. So you don't have to express it using code and classes or Python objects. You just express it in a way that everyone in the GraphQL ecosystem can understand it. And then you put it in the engine and you're good to go. And we'll see how. They offer an AO HTTP integration. They embed a GraphQL development web interface to help you as well. Uh, and, and so it's pretty developer friendly. Tastes very good. This is what the SDL looks like. Uh, so you define a query and then you will basically define types. So here I'm defining the type member, which refers to the member type in the REST uh, Trello API. That is either you or someone in Trello. And then you have your properties and then Scala associated to it, okay? So this is not Python. This is not any kind of language. This is the SDL, the, the standard SDL that defines uh, schemas in, uh, in, uh, in GraphQL and that can be uh, understood by any kind of language or library. What's interesting as well is uh, if you look at the Trello API uh, documentation, you see that the, the member object uh, will uh, have a property that is uh, listing the ID of the boards. That means that when you query a member, you will get the IDs of the boards and not the details of the boards themselves. So uh, when you operate the REST uh, Trello API, of, uh, you have to get the member get the list of IDs of the boards, and then for each board, if you just wanted to display the name, you would have to make a single query with the ID to the board's endpoint, and then get the name out of it, right? This is how you would do it in REST. GraphQL allows you to abstract this, because this is, this graph theory is behind it, so you will have only to add the board, uh, board's edge that will be a list of board objects. So this is how you will present it to your, uh, in your GraphQL endpoints. And then the machinery or the magic that, uh, that, uh, that you have to do is to abstract this and make sure that your, um, your, your GraphQL endpoint does all those REST calls for you. But 
for the front end uh, or the initial query, you will have one query that will end up in being three queries to the RESTful APIs. So that's one of the key features, let's say, of, uh, of GraphQL, but you can see, uh, you can see it e in here, so it's, uh, it's, ex it's explained. Show me some code now. Uh, how do you create this? Uh, you have the generic SDL, so it's in the middle. You create the engine and you pass it the path to the file, to the SDL file, raw file, that, uh, that is on, on, your, on, your, on your project, and that's all. And then it gets validated, et cetera, and then your engine is ready to get queried, basically. So when you then issue a query to a type uh, inside the, your GraphQL uh, schema, it will need so, to know some resolvers that are able to resolve, to get the data that we are asking for. So that's what the import of resolver is about. And to write resolvers in Tartiflet is just a simple decorator pointing to the node that we are talking about in the schema. So if we remember the query uh, and we have the type member, you will just have to create your async def, a simple async uh, 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 function, and, um, and decorate it with the resolver, and that's all. You will return a dict object that will represent the, the that will have properties, and if in those properties they represent an edge, then the engine will for you look for, hey, do I have a resolver for the board's edge? Because for now I just have the IDs, and I need to go and look for those IDs, I need the names, but they were not provided on the first call. It orchestrates, it orchestrates everything, exactly. So it will iterate like this through the graph based on what got queried, and then just call the resolvers functions like this. Simple, e super easy. It will do it in, 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 in concurrently as well, so it's also quite fast, and it's really easy to reason with. So here you see that I uh, get my, uh, my board from the ID board that got uh, returned uh, the, in the JSON from Trello, and then I just have to loop for each ID board and get the, the, the name, and then I will just return the object that, is, um, that has been returned by Trello. I didn't have to filter as well, because the filtering is already done by the GraphQL engine as well. So that's all. Root query resolver, and then edge resolver. OK, now let's ship it. So the first thing you have to do is a Docker file. Uh, this is a demonstration of a multi-stage build to get uh, a, a smaller image at runtime, so I find it very, very helpful. So I'm providing this uh, for you to, to come back to it. As you can see on like 25, uh, you also have to enforce the nobody user has running your application, and um, that's basically how, how it's built. Then the workflow itself on the Git on the Git side, uh, we will have the build, and uh, the build will relate to the Git the current Git branch. So I provide a simple script just to showcase how you can, and you can do it in a, in a hook, how to build and deploy the image to your GitLab registry based on the current uh, branch you're working on. So development branch will be development um, um, instance or pod on, on, on Kubernetes. Staging branch will get you a staging um, um, pod in Kubernetes. For production, it's on master plus git tag. So it's a bit more complicated than that, that just the bash here, but it's, it's uh, how we do it easily. Now you have to deploy it to Kubernetes. For this, you create a deployment YAML. I trimmed it a bit because they are quite verbose. You can see that uh, we also enforce in the deployment the run as uh, nobody. And then uh, we get the secrets and we provide them uh, uh, from the Kubernetes secrets and we provide them to the code as environment variables, so, so that's how it's done. And on the developer side as well, you can ask to get your Let's Encrypt SSL endpoint with the domain that you want, and it will create it for you for free. So I'm crazy enough to have uh, a quick demo. Yeah, with my HHKB keyboard. So you're ready? Okay, let's go. So basically, you type three. 
I can do it without my hands. Uh, and you just <laughs> build and upload this. So this will build the thing and upload it to GitLab. And then you can see that for now it's not running. So there's no deployment for our, our project. So then we will apply the development deployment. So here you can see that it's being created on Kubernetes. Now it's there, but it's not ready yet. Zero on one. So let's see if there is a service. Yes, we have an IP for our service. Is, it, is the pod created? Not yet. Uh, now it's created, it's running, and now it's ready. That's all, and I have my SSL as well. Takeaway on GraphQL, it removes friction, it helps teams collaborate because this gives you a spec, and so it normalizes how data is addressed and, and, and communicated between teams. Having a SDL approach, I think, lets people concentrate on the data, it's really important and not the code. Tartiflex is really modern and has this SDL approach and it's very good, I think. So give it a, give it a try. We have a workflow uh, for environment deployment, get on Git branches. Uh, maybe we will challenge the multi-tenancy of the cluster later, as I told you before, and that will, it will maybe have an impact on this. Uh, the secrets are shared to applications as environment variables and we, we still have to work on generalizing Vaults and uh, have, giving power to the developers, we de we decided to give them the kubectl uh, as the, as their main tool to interact with the cluster. So maybe at some point it will, when the adoption grows, um, we will add uh, some and allow some other abstraction uh, to interact with it, just as Helm. But for now, uh, it's working on pretty well. And that's it. You have all the source code in here. Uh, you can reach me out here, and uh, I, I think we still have a, some time for questions. Thank you very much. If anyone has a question for Alexis, please come to the microphones in the aisles. Thank you for the presentation. And I wanted to ask why you decided on using bare metal instead of using either cloud provider for the service and then Kubernetes on your own or using fully Kubernetes as a service? Because most of our applications interact with data and this data is on our own infrastructure. So okay. we have a hybrid approach with cloud, not fully cloud based. But we come from the bare metal approach and this is something that first we value very much because uh, we value the skills of the people that work with us and that's our own machines, own skills. It's also something that we have to, to, to cope with because it requires some extra work, of course, but mostly because all the data that lies behind it uh, is also hosted on our machines. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really liked your document on page. That was really great. Um, um, do you use some some tools to deploy the, the YAML files, or are you just use the kubectl like like you saw there? Kubectl. Uh, but like, if you have to, because you have a de de uh, staging and then prod like three environments, so you create three YAML files for exactly. each services. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Um, oh yeah. Um, I was wondering when you have the uh, ingress injects, nginx, and um, and do, do you actually host nginx inside of each of the pods that runs Python as well? No, oh. we have a separate namespace for all the ingress because we apply <laughs> network policies between the namespaces as well. Oh, okay. thank you. I don't think your mic is working, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. Can you, I didn't, thank you. Hi. Hi. Since you're operating your own Kubernetes cluster, have you considered using OpenShift instead? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't uh, evaluated or benchmarked the one, one solution? We did, no, we didn't evaluate it. Uh, we, 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 we haven't quite deep, deep dive approach, so we, we wanted to operate Kubernetes, that's for sure, and then we wanted to operate it 
uh, with no other things. That because I think it's easier to, to install locally on uh, your bare metal clusters. Maybe, but uh, I'm not sure this is provided in Gen2 Linux. No, there are YAML scripts to install. Yeah, but it doesn't fit with our how we operate our own infrastructure today. Mm -hmm. So it just for us it's more natural to just go for the packages themselves, and then okay, go for every brick because we have all the Ansible tool set already at our disposal. Okay, thank you for the answer. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Alexis. Let's have a, a hand for him. Thank you.